Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, very odd for me. I'm used to being walking, walking in and out of the crowd while I speak. So today I get to sit down and, and stay in one place and, and I'll probably start fidgeting pretty heavy here in a minute. Um, basically what we did was we took a four hour lecture uh, that was three full PowerPoints and we shrunk it, shrunk it down to about three slides. And we're gonna start off, we have three, three uh, major topics. One is when to call the vet, uh, one is making a diagnosis, and the other is developing a herd health plan. All of these actually are tied together and they're, they're uh, interwoven with each other. Um, you can see by the title here, y'all have heard love in the time of cholera, maybe. This is uh, beef health in the time of COVID. So uh, most of this will be off the cuff and we're just going to read the basic slides. And then what I hope to do is have you all bounce a lot of questions my way um, and we'll, we'll try to answer it. I need you to put your preconceived ideas of what herd health is away. Most uh, beef producers, especially new beef producers, look at herd health as I need a vaccine plan and give me a list of vaccines that I'm supposed to use. Uh, we're not going to do that today, and we haven't done that in all the years that I've given this this series. So we'll we'll start off um, if I can figure out how to make this thing move. There we go. That's who we are. Uh, Cross Timbers was founded in 1958 uh, here in Monte County, and uh, we service about 150 herds. Uh, we have two clinics that are associated with our hospital, and then we are basically we have uh, an association. Uh, with five other hospitals. So we actually, we actually run about 11 veterinarians, all, all said, all done. We are heavy cow-calf and heavy stalker in our orientation, but we do provide uh, rural mixed animal practice for just about any species that somebody can, can bring in. Uh, so I think Gabby's already introduced me, said all, blew all my whistles and all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna, we're gonna just roll right into it and see see how we get along. Okay, so we're gonna start off, like I said, the first section is when to call the veterinarian. And most of you think in the back of your mind or when I've given this lecture before, um, for several years, most people think that the time to call your veterinarian is when you have a problem. The time to make contact with your veterinarian is when you already have sick animals um, in the field or in the chute or when you're trying to pull a calf that weighs more than the heifer you're pulling it out of. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna talk about a few things, um, four or five topics, um, about when to call the veterinarian. And it, it starts with a general heading of call the veterinarian before. And I mean, that's before you buy cows. Um, often your veterinarian can tell you what cows fit your environment, uh, what cows, um, fit, your, fit the, the land that you have and, and fit your, your expertise or your experience. Um, breeds are different, cattle are different. And, and to say that you can jump right in and start raising purebred Kianinas on 10 acres just outside of Fort Worth probably is not a good idea. Um, but get with your veterinarian, sit down and, and figure out what you wanna do with, with your cattle and why you're, why you're um, you're raising cattle in the first place. That is a question that we, we seem to answer when we develop herd health plans. It's the first question we ask, which is why, why do you have cattle or why do you want cattle? Uh, the reasons can range anywhere from um, we want to pass the ranch on to our grandkids to we like animals with big horns or black hair or spotted hides. Um, we've had producers that wanted 11 cows in their front yard for their, their annual corporate meeting, and then they wanted those cows to go away. We've had producers that have used cows to just graze off ground so they can hunt birds on it. Um, we've had producers, if you made a list of all the potential business models for raising cattle, I think we've seen the vast majority of them. Uh, with a young associate today, we were talking about what's a growing area for us and that's actually performance cattle. So cattle that are using cutting operations, cattle that are using roping operations, bulldogging, uh, basically entertainment and the health concerns that we have there. So when you, when you decide that you wanna have cattle on your operation or on your land, I, I would say the first person that you call um, right before your county agent is, is your, local, your local veterinarian. 
uh, I want you to call the vet before you have problems. The idea here is prevention, not, not um, trying to play catch up, but to get ahead of the problems before they develop. Your veterinarian will know what problems affect cattle in your area of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and, and will be able to help you prevent those problems before they even start. Um, so the I again remember the idea is is prevention. It's always cheaper um, in the long run to prevent than it is to try to treat. Once you get into the next two on this list, illness and death, uh, you're sort of sort of fully committed. Um, and and we'll talk about morbidity and mortality later in this section. But what we want to do is prevent illness and prevent death. And to do that, we have to, to have a plan ahead of time uh, with you designed to meet the cattle for the program that you're trying to start. I listed illness and death. And like I said, once you get there, you're sort of behind the eight ball, but it's, it's a time that you um, regardless would be calling the veterinarian. And we're gonna talk about some things like action points and what constitutes a, a um, an emergency later on in this section. So we'll move to the next one, which is action points. And by that, that's just a name we came up with when we're talking to our beef clients, um, especially our new beef clients. And we throw out words like uh, morbidity and mortality. And all that is respectively is um, sickness and death. And there's a point in there where you will be uncomfortable. If you have a lot of experience, you might be comfortable with 2% of your herd being sick or losing 1% of the calves you put on wheat. Everybody will have a different action point as it is related or as it goes back to, um, to their experience level um, and, and to what they're comfortable with. And it also goes back to money. Um, we said this last year during this meeting that it, it may sound coarse, but everything finally boils down to money. And your action point may be like the lady that called me yesterday is one animal one time being ill is too many and and then you might be more experienced in this and and you're used to handling some situations or as one client has said if you have them you will lose them and losing a few head doesn't bother you but losing 20 head does um, I had a client from out in the panhandle that's been calling me we're working through a case out there and and literally the bulls are are um, so valuable that having one of them ill, and this is a person with 40 years experience, but having one bull ill with a contagious disease um, is his action point. And that's when they make their call. You may decide that uh, you can tolerate an illness for a week, but you can't tolerate it for two weeks. And that goes into the duration of whatever is going on. Um, you may think, um, I can handle this as long as it doesn't go on very long. Um, uh, some clients will call us and, and they'll say, well, you know, I've had animals dying for, for three months and now I want to know what it is. Uh, sometimes that's a little late and, and, and the die has been cast and it's very hard to play catch up. But you as a producer, as it's related to why, why you are raising cattle, you need to come up with an idea of what your action points are. What sickness level are we going to tolerate? What death level are we going to tolerate? What duration of problems are we going to tolerate? Uh, and how, how much money can we afford to lose before we get help? And those are things that when you sit down with your veterinarian at the very beginning, he or she can outline to you uh, action points. Um, if this happens, you don't hesitate. You pick up the phone and you call immediately. If this happens, you can wait a little while. And, and it's been ac accentuated during this COVID episode with us of using remote, uh, remote diagnosis or at least remote evaluation. In the state of Texas, it is illegal to make a diagnosis over the phone or by electronic means. Uh, but during this time when we've been fairly restricted to our county, um, we've been using a lot of cell phones and a lot of tablets, a lot of videos have been being taken. Um, a lot of photographs and, and being sent into either our email or just texted to us, um, your veterinarian may charge for that service. Um, but it's a good way to say, yep, I need to come out right now and see it, 
or it can wait till next week or it can wait till tomorrow or you need to bring that animal to the hospital. So it's also good when you're designing these action points to come up with um, the use of technology and how we could use technology to, to benefit ourselves in, in getting the veterinarian out there. So let's go on and we're gonna define emergency because everybody likes to call their veterinarian uh, being facetious here, but y'all like to call us when it's about two o'clock in the morning or when it's 118 degrees outside and, and it's, it's, it's time to go to work. So basically the way we've described emergency to people is if it's on the outside of the body and it belongs inside the cow, that's an emergency. And then the other one that goes with that is if it's on the inside of the cow and it belongs outside the cow, that's an emergency. So let's talk about that for, for just a little bit. Um, if it's outside the cow and it, and it belongs in, this could be like a prolapsed uterus. This could be uh, quite a bit of blood. This may be a, an eye or a tongue. Um, these are traumatic events. These are events that need e immediate um, immediate attention. If it's inside the cow and needs to come out, it could be something like a, a cabin situation uh, that you're in. It could be um, a situation where, where the animal is bloated and we need to get the gas off the animal. Um, so these are two ways to really easily, easily uh, categorize your emergencies. The other one, again, we go back to it. If you walk out, uh, like a few days ago happened on a sheep operation up here, uh, the owner went out and there were six dead animals. That's beyond his action point. That's too many sheep at one time. That becomes an emergency. So your emergency may be based on numbers. Your emergency may be based on, uh, on death loss, or it may be based just strictly on, we've lost way too much money, we need you now. Use your veterinarian, we see information down there. Use your veterinarian as a primary source of of information. We all like we all like to go everywhere to get information, whether it's from our neighbor, the coffee shop, the feed store, um, online on Google. Um, there's just such a plethora of places that you can get information now. Our problem is trying to figure out if the information is valid. Y'all have seen this uh, during this entire coronavirus outbreak. Um, there are some sources of information that are extremely good, and there are some sources that are not. And I'm amazed at the number of people that rely on Facebook to get their information on everything from COVID-19 to black leg and cattle. Uh, we have really good access now to wonderful information. And one of the, the first sources of that should be your local veterinarian. Um, the medical sources on Google cannot address your local community. They can't address your, your county. They can't address the weather that's going on in your county, whether you're in a drought or it's snowing. Uh, the one that can help you with that is your veterinarian. And he or she should become your primary source for healthcare. And most clinics, um, phone calls are free. And what, what we have found is if, if we open one primary line, then we can absorb a lot of other sources of information and we can coalesce that into something that, that benefits you instead of uh, taking hearsay and then wondering why we, we don't have a, a, a functional treatment or a functional prevention program. Sort of winding up this, and, and believe me, we have condensed this. This was about an hour and a half by itself. Um, but winding this up, we want to also talk about when not to call the veterinarian. Um, when not to uh, pick up the phone and give a call. And, and every year this gets people riled up, um, but it's true and it's based on, 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 on real events. But don't call your veterinarian if the animal that you're concerned about it is not yours. Um, we will not castrate your neighbor's bull. Um, we can't come and, and, and get your brother-in-law's heifers off your place. Um, so if the cows are not yours, it's, it's a waste of our time and a waste of yours to give us a ring. Some of this is tongue in cheek, but y'all will, will catch the drift. Don't call us if what you're asking us to do is illegal. Um, we have a lot of young veterinarians that we're trying to get um, motivated to stay in rural Texas and, and, and rural Southern Oklahoma. And our, our problems are they get really scared when they get caught up with the, 
Texas Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners because they've been convinced to do something illegal, whether that's an illegal drug, um, an illegal prescription, uh, false health papers, um, anything, you know, any regulatory work that, that um, you might want done illegally, it's just not a good time to, to call the vet. You will end up without a veterinarian in your community. Um, if you have no intention of com complying, if you call the vet clinic, they give you their advice, they tell you their prevention plan, and, and your intention is, is to ignore them, it, it, again, it's a waste of time. Um, don't call us if, if the cattle are, that you want us to look at or the cow that you want us to pull the calf from or, or the bull that we have to remove the hunting arrow out of his hip um, is not caught. There's a lot of clients that feel that we, that we have special ways of getting them out of the brush out of the cactus, out of the mesquite, and into the chute, and, and we really don't. Um, so if the animal's not caught, don't give us a call. And then the last one that really um, sends young veterinarians away from rural environment is if you have no intention of paying your bill, um, don't call these young guys out. They have a lot of bills to pay, and they're coming out on, on, on the good intention that um, they're gonna be paid for their service. So if it's not yours, if it's not legal, if you're not going to pay, if you're not going to comply, if the animal's not caught, you really don't need a veterinarian. Um, so that's the time when not to call a vet. So basically the reason I put this, this section first, the reason this section goes first is just so we can start getting a basis of what, what problems are and the role of your veterinarian. You, you, in order to receive prescriptions and to to have a relationship, you have to develop what's called a veterinary client patient relationship with your veterinarian. They are your best source for information on diseases and healthcare issues on cattle within your county or within your region of Texas or Oklahoma. Um, so they are the source for you. Remember to call them before you buy cattle, let them help develop your action points. Later we'll be talking about what's normal in cows so you can uh, develop what's an emergency and what's not. Use them as your primary source of information and, and, and remember, um, let, let's uh, try to have good reasons to call them when you do. So Gabby, I can take questions now if there are any or anybody has a discussion that they'd like to follow up because we've, we've pretty well walked through section one. Yes. Okay. So I did have one that was emailed to us um, prior to the class day. Let me grab it right quick. Okay. So it's kind of a complex question. Um, just answer it your best way. Um, the best way you know how. Okay. So it says uh, our three year our three year old bull just tested not sound after we did a preg check on nineteen cows and found none to be pregnant. Being new at this, we did not know that we needed to get our bull tested yearly, and we had just had a 94% calving rate with this bull. The plan is to sell the not sound bull, and we have already purchased a new bull that we will receive on August the 8th. Uh, the new bull is about 20 months old, and we are in the process of getting it tested. Anyways, our question is, we want to put the bull uh, on the open cows right away. This really blows the whole spring calving season theory up, but we do not want to lose a, a whole year. What are your recommendations? Oh, wow. <laughs> no, that's, that's kind of a very, um, that's a lot there, so. No, that, and, that, and that, question really, that question really falls down into the third, the third section, but we're going to answer, we're going to attempt to answer it now, and we'll probably keep coming back to it okay. until, until we get it figured out. Yes, you should test bulls every year. Remember that your BSC, your breeding soundness exam on a bull, it's just a snapshot in time. So it's just that one day, that one moment that he's uh, being collected that you can tell um, if his semen is good or not. When we do a BSC, we're looking not only at the bull's semen, but we're looking at um, his physical exam, we're looking at his temperament, we're looking at his age, um, Bulls are a valuable part of your herd. They're more than 50% of your herd. And so um, a bull can go bad for a number of reasons. He can go bad from trauma, uh, disease, um, 
a fever can take him out and just degeneration of his testicles can lead the bull where he's sterile. We also have forms of VD out there. The biggest one that we chase around in Texas uh, right now is trick and the bull regardless of age. So the new 20 month old bull that you purchased should come to you one with a BSE, a breeding sound exam and two with a negative trick test. And then when he arrives at your place, you should repeat the breeding soundness exam and repeat the trick test. Um, you, you really need three negative trick tests to be absolutely positive that he doesn't have trick. Um, most people get by with one because uh, that's the law. But if you're going to bring him in with a negative trick and a good BSC, have your veterinarian that you've established a relationship with rerun uh, both those tests. Um, so as far as designing the when you're going to calve, sometimes it is better to wait um, and hold your bull back than to, to change your entire production schedule and, and mess it up. It is a tough decision to make. Um, you, you may be better off just waiting and readapting in. It depends on how many cows and the reason that you're raising cows. If raising cattle is the primary source of your income, then you are in a situation that you need to respond to immediately. Um, if it's not, and you can do something else for a few months before you put that bull in, it may be, it may be better to try to stay on your production schedule. Again, see your local veterinarian, sit down and say, okay, we've got this disruption to our schedule. Um, how can we adapt this to switch from a spring calving to a fall calving? How can we switch from a fall calving to a spring? Do we have the potential to do both? Um, to have some cows that are spring calvers and some that are fall. It is a complicated schedule or complicated um, calculation. You need to sit down with a calendar and, and then also look at the question that was asked at the very beginning. Why are we in the cattle business? Um, do we have to make money on this? The, this year, is it for tax purposes? You know, why are we in the cow business? Um, but again, um, in, our, in our normal presentation on this, we will talk about developing a herd health production calendar. And, and it's a service that our clinic offers. And we, we will sit down and all these BSEs will be included. Um, things like BSE, preg checking, ultrasounding, reproductive tract scoring, they will all be placed uh, on a calendar for you. Um, uh, that's a start at that question. Let me think on it some more. Okay. Okay. That's a, that's a perfect answer. Um, and I think that it's probably best anyways to kind of really, before you just make a quick decision to analyze all the, all the pieces that go in there. And I think given that they should go see their, their local vet and have them sit down with the calendar and whatnot. I think that's, that's good sound advice. So I'll, I'll be sure to pass that on. Um, let me see if there's anything else I hear yet. Okay. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Folks, just remember um, as we're going along, if things come about, just uh, send it out to the Q&A and or the chat box and I'll be monitoring those. Um, there's nothing else out there right now, Dr. Anderson, if you want to go on to the second session. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep rolling, and, and this is a new experience for me. Um, so we'll see how it works, and, and we'll go from there. Let's go to the next one. So diagnosis. Uh, everybody wants to be able to diagnose their problems on their place, um, make, make a call, and, and get their own treatment because they believe that it will save them money. It will save them time. Um, and, and, and so they, they sort of try to shortcut out from, from underneath using a veterinarian. This is sometimes where we get into a lot of trouble um, because of the source of the information that is being used. Um, you know, I had a client two weeks ago that insisted that using uh, transmission oil on a cow was the best cure for the problem that he had. Uh, I'm not sure where he got that from but I can tell you that transmission oil is, is not a cure for any abnormalities in beef cows. Um, we have to remember as we go in diagnosing problems in cattle, we have to remember that um, at some point, regardless of why you're raising that cow, at some point uh, there's a high potential that this will be a hamburger or a steak on somebody's plate. And we, we need to, um, 
take care to protect the, the food source of our country um, and, and, and offer up a quality product. So this section is designed on basically uh, coming back and tying into when the call of that to um, help you figure out if you have a problem to begin with. So when I'm in person with you, I like to walk around the classroom and I like to say, do you know what the normal temperature of a cow is? Do you know what the respiratory rate is? Do you know uh, what the heart rate is? Or what, what should be the profile of a cow from the back, from the front? Um, we can start off really, really easily with, with, you know, what's the gestation period of a cow? So if you're a new cattle raiser, this is a time where it's actually fun. You can get yourself uh, the Merck manual, you can get yourself uh, raising cattle the easy way or whatever book you want. But what it entails is um, it's a good time to tell your spouse or your family or your job that you have to go out and work on diagnosing your cattle where you can sit on the back of your tailgate, watch your cows in their normal behavior uh, and, and drink your favorite beverage. I, you need to know normal before you can determine what abnormal is. And so if you're just now starting off in the cattle business, it's a really good time to get out there and see what normal behavior is. How often do they eat? How often do they lay down? When they calve, what is the normal time frame related around calving? Uh, during breeding, when do they breed? How long does this take? Um, all of this, what is the normal body condition score of your cattle? Um, we can talk about body condition score, but, but the idea is you have to know what normal is before you can venture out into abnormal. Um, your veterinarian can help you with this in, in getting you the statistics that you need or getting the information that you need. Um, and, and it can, uh, it's actually, it's actually fun. And the more that you, the better you get at observation, the better you will get at, at knowing your cattle and knowing when you need help. Um, I have had a lot of producers that have matured into the fact where when they call me and say, I just know that something is not right. And I fully trust them and fully believe them. When we used to do a lot of dairy work, dairymen are around their cattle all the time, day in and day out. And if a dairyman calls and says, I don't think cow 152 is acting normal, um, we head out because they know the difference between normal and abnormal. They know what is normal in behavior, body condition score, um, physical characteristics. And, and then they're able to call when, when they believe there's a problem. Here we like to teach y'all how to do local versus systemic. And, and, and then we'll talk about systems here in a minute. So um, local means, is this something that's just like this morning we had a heifer brought in that had very small skin lesions where the hair had fallen out. Um, that's a local situation. Um, we also had a calf that had histophilus somnus, that was, that's a respiratory disease, that was extremely ill, uh, running 105 temp, increased respiratory rate, increased respiratory effort. This animal, this animal died, uh, and necropsy was able to show us um, that it had histophilus somnus as well as a disease called mycoplasma. So, um, you need to be able to tell your veterinarian, one, the cow is abnormal because of this and have your list. And two, um, this is a local, a local problem localized onto one area of the body or a systemic problem where I think the animal is systemically ill or it could actually be a herd problem. We've had a big outbreak up here, woody tongue, uh, during all this rain uh, that we had and the heat. And so sometimes on woody tongue, the most we've seen in one herd is 50% of the herd uh, of the cattle were occupied and, and, and that consisted of about 30 head. So it, it was a big deal and a big problem. So you can go local, systemic, or herd. Um, and I failed, to, I failed to put that, the herd in there. Um, so what, what are some of the systems that you might be looking at when you're trying to make a diagnosis? It's, it's literally everything that constitutes the health of the animal. Um, so you can have special senses like smell or eyesight um, or, or you can have neurologic symptoms. You can have reproductive, respiratory, GI, and skin. Those are your major systems um, that we look at. So once we determine we know the animal is abnormal, something is going on that's not right, 
we've made a determination for your veterinarian you have at home that says this is a localized problem, it's a systemic problem, or it's a herd problem. So today, with the man that brought in the cow that had, um, that had the skin lesions, uh, he was able to say this skin situation, it's, a, it's in the system of the skin, it's abnormal, and it appears to be localized, but it is affecting many, many animals. So it was local and a herd situation. It turned out to be an insect bite hypersensitivity to coelacoides, which are buffalo gnats. And we were losing some hair related to, to the allergic reaction to those. But you need to sit down and try to figure out what system is affected. So if her uterus is hanging out, it's a, it's a local, if she has a prolapse, it's a abnormal, it's a local situation. Um, and it's in the reproductive tract. And so you can tell your veterinarian this, you've made the diagnosis, at least you've localized where it is, and this will lay, allow your veterinarian to make a, a diagnosis of if they have to come out and help you, help you or, or not help you. Um, so we're trying to make your diagnosis in the field into a system, into a program where you can make check marks by it and determine what's going on and, and, um, and focus your attention that way and get help to your cattle uh, more, more quickly. As you gain more experience with this, your, your ability to diagnose will expand. This is basically how they teach veterinarians to start uh, making diagnosis. One, recognizing it's abnormal. Two, where is it located? Three, what system is involved? Um, and, and start making diagnoses uh, based on that. So we had a client, oh, it was a few months ago, they had some stalkers that were ready to go to a feedlot. And the day before they shipped, about 15 of them had collapsed in their, in their traps where they were kept. Uh, some of them were already dead. Some of them were neurologic. And he, with his experience, had already said, okay, this appears to be neurologic or, or, or skeletal, musculoskeletal. And, and, um, it, it, it also uh, appears to be herd wide and it appears to be systemic. And he was able with his experience to say, I think it's either they're getting a toxin in their feed or they have black leg. Uh, when we went out and approached the situation and began with the physical exam and, and autopsies, um, we were able to determine that it was, it was black leg. The problem with that is he had um, right out about 200 head and they were to be shipped the next day and we had to block that shipment and we had to treat all the remaining animals. But before he ever called us, he had narrowed down his diagnostic uh, potentials down to really just two things. Um, and we were able to rule those out very quickly with, with, a, uh, with a necropsy or an autopsy in veterinary medicine. And so he had gone through the whole, the whole situation. He had his action points, he knew when to call, he knew um, what was his trigger points be, that would make him call. And in this case, it was uh, too many head and too many, too many ill and too many that had died. Um, and he called us out after having made, narrowing down his diagnostic um, potentials. One thing I wanna throw in there as, as, we, work, as we work through this is, is recognizing that um, there are a lot of zoonotic diseases in our cattle industry. Um, zoonotic means that the, you can get these from, they're spread from animals to man. So in some sense, COVID-19 is zoonotic. It, it mutated out of the animal kingdom and into human beings, and it has caused real problems. We see this with diseases in cattle, like, um, oh, leptospiridia is one, rabies is one. Um, that, that pop up. Even ringworm is considered a, a, a zoonotic disease um, and, and can lead to problems in humans. So I want you to be very careful. I've had, I've had clients that have gone out and attempted to do a necropsy untrained and literally end up either with lepto or end up with mycoplasma in a joint on one individual that cut his hand during a, a necropsy. Your veterinarian, if you develop a relationship with them, can show you, especially if your ranch is far away, they can show you um, what samples to take to make a diagnosis. They can show you how to do a necropsy. They can follow you like we do on some, 
doing a necropsy on FaceTime. So it's a remote necropsy. You're being guided by a veterinarian that might be three or four hours away. This is a service that we offer. And on some of the bigger ranches, it allows their cowboys to make a decision very rapidly at a very advanced stage of this di diagnosis and confirmation. So I need you to remember that there are zoonotic diseases. Try to develop a system where you know when to call a veterinarian, but you know also to present data over the phone. What is abnormal? Is it local systemic or herd or a combination thereof? What systems are involved? And then he, he, can, he can also, he or she can also help you avoid um, causing, causing harm to yourself. We, we have had people exposed to rabies. We've had uh, people exposed to vesticular tomatitis. Um, it, it, it goes on and on the number of zoonotic diseases. So, uh, Gabby, any questions? Yes, we've gotten some that have rolled in. Some may pertain to that first section a little bit, but, um, there's a follow up from this section, um, towards the bottom. Someone was asking, um, on the animals that you mentioned that had died of black leg, were they immunized against that? Uh, they had received one vaccine. Uh, so clostridial diseases like black leg, uh, tetanus is one, botulism is one. Uh, but for, for the clostridial diseases that cause black leg, the common name black leg, you need at least two vaccines, regardless, two vaccinations, regardless of what your bottle says. There's a product out there that says you can give one time and it's protective, not with clostridial vaccines. It's not. So these animals had received one vaccine one black leg vaccine, and they were to receive another at the feedlot. The problem is they died in the meantime. Um, so yes, they had received one, but not two. Gotcha. Um, and then someone asked, can cattle catch COVID-19? <laughs> no, so veterinarians, um, we've been dealing with um, coronavirus for years and years and years, uh, mainly in the GI form that causes uh, profuse scours or diarrhea in young calves. But for the last several years, we've been de dealing with the respiratory form as a primary form of pneumonia. And it's been recognized as that. So COVID-19, the answer is no. Coronavirus, the answer is yes. And um, it's hard for us to vaccinate them well enough uh, using the preparations that were made for the GI form to protect against the respiratory form. Uh, cattle are running 106 degree temps for 14 days, with normal cattle temp being 102. Uh, but this is not a disease spread from man to cows or cows to man, uh, not the COVID-19 part of this. It is interesting that veterinarians have dealt with coronavirus for years, and one of the ways that we uh, control it is by separating sick animals and preventing nose-to-nose -nose contact. Um, so basically social distancing. Okay, perfect. Um, Y'all can laugh because I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> we can't put little masks on the cows, um, but we can keep them apart from each other. And, and that, that helps. So, okay. Proven science there. Um, <laughs> okay, we have a question from Derek. He's asking, or he said, once a year, it seems like I have a cow or a bull that develops a significant limp on the front leg. I've always taken the approach to keep an eye on them and let, then let it heal. However, I'd have to, after having that approach in result, uh, I've found that the animal sometimes becomes more in trouble and then they further need vet assistance. Um, I assume they may be stepping on something or maybe possibly stepping in a hole. Um, what do you think, or sorry, what do you look for in limps of the leg or the hoof issues? And are there any rules of thumb of when to call the vet? And he also said that the breed he has is a longhorn and they're smaller and pretty resilient. Ah, we can argue about that. Modern longhorns have become pretty pampered, y'all. I have actually seen fat longhorns, which will drive you nuts. But anyway, long story short, there are some rules of thumb. 90% of lameness in cattle is in their feet, regardless. That's a proven fact. It's demonstrated by research. So if you have an animal that draws up lame, um, what you can do on your place if you have the facilities 
and, and can do so safely is to look at the bottom of those feet. Make sure you don't have a nail, a foreign body, a rock, a thorn. Um, make sure that it's not raw between their toes. 90% of lameness is in the feet. Um, to work higher up on the legs, like falling in a hole or, or, or getting kicked, that's soft tissue trauma, and that will steadily normally get better over time. It won't get worse. If you have an infection that people are calling foot rot, uh, that's caused by several bacteria, but mainly by fusiform bacterium. If you have that, uh, you, you could really do a lot of good just by giving antibiotics prescribed by your veterinarian. So it is important, next time you get a lame cow, get them up, look at the foot. Does it smell bad? Is it red? Does it have a nail sticking in it? If you have a foreign body, it's right away time to call a veterinarian. By foreign body, I mean a nail, a thorn, um, a piece of tin. I had a cow that showed up uh, from the same ranch. We had two cows, one on, 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 on subsequent days. The first one showed up with a number 10 coffee can around her foot with her foot punching through the bottom. And she was like, the next day a cow showed up with a coffee pot, a metal coffee pot around her foot. Um, and it turned out that they had an old dump on their ranch that nobody knew about. We just thought it was funny. They came in one with a Folgers can the first day and the second day another cow came in with a coffee pot. Um, but the, 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 the thing to do is realize 90% of it's in their feet if it's a soft tissue injury, they will typically get better on their own. That's a big statement. Um, but your, your veterinarian can prescribe anti-inflammatories to help with that. He can do for, further diagnostic testing. If you've torn a cruciate ligament or something in the knee, those don't get better. Um, and your veterinarian can also get you antibiotics so your foot rot problem does not keep getting bigger. And so in your initial discussion with your vet, he would ask you, uh, what problems have you had in the past? And you may bring up this lameness. And he may say, well, we can add foot rot vaccine to your, to your vaccination protocol, um, if that's what the problem is. Does that answer the question? It's hard for me to see, Gabby, because nobody can shake their head yes. So, you still there? Yes, yeah, sorry, I stuck it on mute for a second because we have a brat of a cat over here being loud. Um, yeah. Okay, so, um, Thanks for the answer on that one. Uh, we have another one from Don. Um, he, he says, I purchased a registered bull at a registered cattle sale that was tested fertile and guaranteed to be a breeder. The first year he had no offspring and we had him tested at, as he had been collected for the first two to three years of his breeding life and had produced calves. The vet said that the semen was good, but the bull did not extend his penis more than three to four inches and did not exhibit the ability or interest to extend it. Could this be a result of being collected for the first years of his breeding life? Or what are the physical problems which may cause this? Oh, you know, it's a good question. We're going back to breeding soundness exam. One of the things we do on a BSC, and, and we do about 100 BSCs a month. Um, and so one of the things we do is we will inspect all reproductive organs. So we have to visualize the penis. We have to look at and palpate the testicles. And we examine the secondary internal sex glands, uh, like the prostate, uh, seminal vesicles. So in this situation, um, there, there's no way for us to test the bull's libido, which is his sex drive. And you can have a bull that tests extremely well on a breeding soundness exam but won't breed anything. He sleeps under the mesquite tree and eats cubes. Um, so we, we can't test for his libido. The other thing is it sounds like if he's not extending his penis, some bulls will not extend their penis uh, with the ejaculator. Uh, some bulls have to be palpated. Some bulls have to actually be seen mounting a heifer. Um, but it also could be that he's had trauma to his penis in the past, that he has a stricture and is unable to extend his penis. If he's unable to extend, he's unable to breed. He can have the best semen in the world, but in a natural breeding situation, it's not gonna do you any good um, because he can't deliver. And so he could have been injured. He could be a bull that does not respond to an ejaculator and, or he can be a bull that has zero sex drive um, and just sleeps under your, your mesquite tree. Um, in any case, if he were, uh, guaranteed, most, most um, 
most breeders, most purebred or seed stock producers will replace that bull um, if he is not performing. Okay, and we have one that kind of maybe couples with that question. It came in via the email. Um, says, interesting, he just mentioned woody tongue. We took a cow to the vet thinking she had woody tongue or snake bite or abscess. She had lost a lot of weight and her tongue was hanging out and very weak. It actually was a huge animal hip bone lodged in the side of her cheek so that she wasn't able to eat or drink. The vet saved her when we thought we had lost her. Do you think she will ever be able to breed again? Okay, so yeah, you can find foreign bodies. I've found uh, pieces of asphalt, uh, animal bones, uh, oil-filled debris wedged in cow's mouths. They will literally eat anything um, as they're grazing along. Woody tongue is a bacterial infection that's acquired from a puncture wound to the mouth. Here around Monte County, we see it a lot with cockaburs along the creek beds. Cattle will get down there, eat that. They puncture their inside of their mouth, and this thing sets up. Um, if she can regain her body condition score, which she can now that the foreign body has been removed, um, yeah, she should be able to rebreed. The, the reason that she wouldn't breed right now is she may be too thin and her body has shut off her reproductive performance, um, trying to um, direct resources uh, toward gaining weight. Um, so once she gains her body condition score back, she should be able um, to do a good job and rebreed. Okay, and these are two questions, but they're... I think they can be coupled together and we're still on the birthing reproduction side. Uh, the first one is I'm new to cattle ranching. Um, should I give the cow a cow that is birthing some privacy or should I stay close and watch her? And along with that, the next person was saying that they have a 23 month old, healthy, well nourished Angus heifer that just had a C-section for fetal demise at three to five months with decomp of the fetus. What is the most common cause of the dead calf and what are her chances of successful pregnancies going forward? Okay, so let's take these as two different questions and it's, and boy, I wish we were in person because this would be easier, um, but this is working. So with calving uh, on, on, on heifers, we have, a, we have a couple rules, a couple rules of thumb. One, if you don't, it's a rule of three. So if you don't see, uh, two feet in the head or two feet in the tail, don't try to pull that animal. Don't try to extract the calf. So don't run out there with one foot and hook it to the back of your John Deere and, and take off. Unless you see two feet and a head or two feet and a tail, don't attempt anything. That's the time to call your veterinarian. Um, with heifers, we give them two hours to proceed because a lot of times a heifer once we see a fluid bag or some evidence of calving, a heifer will take a lot, lot longer. She actually thinks something has her by the tail end. She doesn't know that she's calving. She hasn't been through it. With adult cattle, um, if they, once you notice a amniotic sac hanging out or the cow trying to calve, if they haven't calved in 45 minutes to an hour, it's time to intervene. Uh, this is where you'd walk in and say, okay, this is abnormal. Uh, she hasn't calved. It appears to be local in the reproductive system and it appears the calf has a foot back or a, a head back. Um, as far as giving them privacy, if you hang around these cattle and you constantly harass them, um, they're gonna slow down. They're not gonna calve. So the best thing to do once you acknowledge they're calving is to actually drive away. If it's a cow, wait an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. If it's a heifer, give her two hours. Um, and this, this takes into account that you're checking your cattle regularly and it's not that you check your cows once a week and you drove up and she's got half a calf sticking out of her. That is not time to drive home. Uh, that's something on the, outs on the inside that needs to be finished coming on the outside. So it's an emergency and it's time to get busy. Um, C-section on a cow, why, you know, you, you had fetal demise at three to five months. Um, this is hard for me to, to completely understand, but um, determining what killed a fetus is extremely hard. If your cow were to miscarry on the pathology floor at Texas A&M, uh, they may be able to diagnose 30% of the causes. There's such a wide array 
of things that could go wrong, uh, whether it be disease, environmental, nutritional, parasitic. Um, it's very difficult to tell what causes the death of the fetus. Normally, a C-section uh, on a cow um, it does not limit the animal's ability to have a baby the following year. There were a lot of uh, cows when we were doing a lot more C-sections that would come in and they would still have the sutures in from the year before. Um, and they'd come in and deliver a live calf. So a C-section done properly doesn't, doesn't actually curtail your ability to breed that cow. Um, I would be worried and sit down with your veterinarian concerning why um, you lost the calf at three to five months. Was it a disease process? Uh, a bred animal, so if we go in and palpate cows, we realize in our neck of the woods, in our part of Texas, that up to 4% of those calves um, will be reabsorbed or miscarried or aborted. So if you, if you preg 100 cows at 60 days um, and then you come around to calving and you only have 96 babies, uh, that would actually be normal. Um, it's just normal attrition to the pregnancy. It's very difficult to determine what caused it. Um, but it's a good time to review your vaccine schedule. It's a good time to review your nutrition. It's a good time to review um, basically your health plan for your cows. Okay. And then um, looks like we have one more question regarding calving. Um, uh, what happens when the calf stops sucking from the mother and the calf gets weak? I have two calves and they sleep a lot. Is that normal? Okay, that's a difficult question for me to answer. I don't know the age of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the age of the calf. Uh, ca calves will get up and suck. Um, moms will hide them in the brush. And one of the common mistakes we see from new cattle raisers is they go out there and they'll scoop up this limp baby that they found in the bushes and they'll run it to the clinic. And all it is, is that baby doing what it's been told to do, which is lay there and be very still so you don't get eaten. And um, there's nothing wrong with them. If the animals are dehydrated, if the animals have um, scours or are clinically ill, that's a different ball game. Um, but calves will get up and lay down and newborn calves will sleep a whole lot. Uh, this is again, goes back to figuring out what is normal and what is abnormal. What is normal behavior for these calves? Um, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that you said they, they were weak. Does this mean that they have a, a medical problem or did you just find them out in the, in the brush? They will be limp as rag dolls and people run those to us and there's nothing wrong with them. Mom has just hidden them in the brush. Um, or told them to lay where, where she wants them to lay. So that's a tough question to, to answer with the information that I have. I'll let you know if they provide any more uh, context on that one. Um, Rick Young uh, said, this might be a good time to ask about anthrax and annual vaccination. On the anthrax question, I'm in the area that is susceptible. Okay, so this is a, per this is a wonderful example. Um, we do not have anthrax. We do not vaccinate for anthrax. This is a situation in production uh, animal medicine, in, in, in commercial cattle production, that I can't really speak to without going back to the literature and looking it up. For the last 30 years, I have not had to answer that question. Um, but I would presume that if your local veterinarian is recommending that you vaccinate, that you, that you should. Um, we don't have that as a that's a, a form of clostridium and it's it's not a problem that we have in this neck of the woods um but it, it, it indicates a really good situation if you got online it may give you a, a four or five different answers where the accurate answer is the one coming from your local veterinarian um in your county okay and um, we have one from Ray that says, I have a five month old calf with several, several warts on its face. He is, uh, he is the only one out of 45 others in the same pasture with these warts. What could have caused this and how should I resolve? Okay, so this is an interesting question also. Realize that warts are caused by viruses. They're caused by a virus, a papilloma virus. And in cattle, they actually get the virus several weeks before they ever ever exhibit a wart. Um, in most cases, warts are self-limiting. They go away on their own. We don't cut them off. We don't vaccinate for them. We, we know that it's gonna walk through all our young stock. Um, it won't affect the adults. The thing that's interesting here is you only have one. 
and they were exposed a long time ago and are just, he's showing now. What would be interesting to do with him is take an ear notch and see if he is positive uh, for, for being a persistently infected BVD calf, bovine viral diarrhea calf. That virus drops their immune system and they can't mount an immune response like the other cattle do and beat this thing. So we've had cattle come in here. We used to have a great video and I wish I could find it again. The cow was a wart from the tip of his nose to the tip of his tail. Um, and he was BVD positive because he has no immune system. And so this is a, a, a situation where one, um, you should test them for BVD because it will allow, as a PI, it will allow you to know if you have BVD in your herd. And two, you need to get rid of this calf. You need to just sell this calf. Um, there are other reasons why his immune system could be depressed, um, but that's what it sounds sounds like to me. And I, I would certainly get your veterinarian out there to work on that problem. Okay, um, we have another one from Steve. Um, as a new producer, what health or sorry, what animal health equipment and supplies should I have on hand? Ah, Steve, that that's all limited to to your experience level. Um, obviously, you're going to need. Um, some way of controlling the animals. So a chute in an alleyway, you're going to need a halter. So when you get them in your chute, you can halter them and pull their head around to look at things. Um, you're probably going to need a thermometer. After that, it's up to your, your veterinarian to figure out what level you're at. Do you need syringe guns? Do you need, you know, do you need necropsy knives? Do you, you know, what else can, do you need palpation sleeves? Do you know how to do that? Um, but the biggest thing you need to do is be able to control the animal in a safe situation. So a shoot in an alleyway. Then the next thing you need is a halter to control their head and a thermometer to take their temp. And you can get a lot fancier than that. But again, that's under the direction of your veterinarian. Okay. And I got a little bit of feedback from Charles about that question on the, the calf being weak. Um, he yeah. just said, it was weak from not getting any milk from the mother and he tried to give her water, but she wouldn't, she was too weak to drink. Okay. So, so you go back to this diagnosis. It's definitely abnormal. The animal appears to be dehydrated. Um, it's systemic, not local. Um, and, and what you have is, is all systems are involved because that's dehydration. So this animal needs to go to the veterinarian. Um, the veterinarian can teach you how to tube feed this animal. We can see if it needs IV fluids. Um, some of these calves are weak because they have, they may be affected by a virus like IBR or BVD. Some of these calves are weak because they were too big and during birth, they're basically, they ran low on oxygen. So they're slow to get started. Again, this is an answer for your, your veterinarian. Okay. And there's one more out there, but I think I'll hold that. Um, you still have one more section left, right? Right. Okay, we're, go ahead on your next section then. Okay, it's about two o'clock. So we're doing okay, right, Gabby? Yes, we're doing perfect. Okay, let's go to the next one, guys, if I can make it happen. Okay, so developing a health plan. So this in our original, uh, our original uh, series of lectures uh, that we would give during an afternoon would be the one where we spent a lot of time um, because this is where people had a lot of questions or uh, in, in some cases, a lot of complaints. Um, we develop health plans and calendars for our clients, or we try to. Um, and sometimes these are, cons these are recommendations that we make, and we'll give this plan to a client, and, and then they choose not to do it. Um, again, we start with the question, why? Why are you in the cattle business? For the man that wanted to have 11 cows in his front yard dur during his corporate meeting, there was no health plan. Rent the cows. Um, it's, it's too expensive to develop a health plan when you're only going to have cows one day every year. Um, so the, the first thing you want to do is, is you've met with your veterinarian. He knows, he or she knows that you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're about to buy cattle or that you have bought cattle. He or she knows why you have the cows. Is it, a, is it for tax purposes? Is it to make money? Is it to continue a tradition? Are you in it? Um, for beef production, are you in it for horns? Are you in it, um, you know, why are you in the cattle business? And then you start with a biosecurity plan. And this goes back, y'all, this goes back to the fact that it's cheaper and easier to prevent the problem than it is to treat the problem. So your veterinarian will sit down as part of your health plan 
and, and they will set up a biosecurity plan of keeping the disease off your ranch to begin with. And it's amazing the number of loopholes that you might not know about. Are you using your trailer back and forth from the sale barn? Are you, do you share a water source with a neighbor? Do you have good fences? Um, do you calve next to a stalker operation? There's a million things involved in a biosecurity plan. This is where you start. How many of y'all have wild hogs? Are wild hogs gonna interrupt your, your health plan? Are they part of your bio, biosecurity challenge? Okay, then we move to biocontainment. Biocontainment is when you've sat down with that veterinarian and you've gone over your health plan and he says, these are your action points. When you have sick cattle, this is what I want you to do with it. So it's the same thing as we're talking about with social distancing in humans. It's when you have a sick animal, how are you gonna contain that illness so it doesn't spread to the rest of your herd? Um, just recently, we, we uh, and a matter of fact, we resolved it um, yesterday morning, um, but a man has a herd of about 100 cows and he had a problem with one cow. And so what he did was one, he's a closed herd. His biosecurity um, is pretty good. Two, when he found the, the sick cow, he moved that cow immediately to a set of pins where there was no contact with anybody else. <clears throat> and, he, and he followed uh, that breeding group that she came out of and checked them twice a day. Uh, this cow ended up being euthanized. Samples have been sent to A&M. It's, uh, it's a fairly serious case at this point. Um, but he did have biosecurity. He did have biocontainment. Uh, his why, he raises cattle because he inherited land and he wants to do something with it. It is not his primary source of income. Um, probably the VCPR, the veterinary client patient relationship, <clears throat> is probably should be at the very top, right under why. Um, that's where you've done all these steps in the first two parts, the first two segments of this discussion. And you've said, um, you know, I know this veterinarian, this veterinarian knows me, this veterinarian is responsible uh, under Texas, Texas law, is responsible for the treatment and follow-up of my cattle. Um, and, and he understands that when I call, my level of experience is X and I need help now, or my level of experience is Y and we can have an educated discussion on the phone and get the animal treated. Um, then th those, those things all come together. They seem like they're just superficial, but a good biosecurity plan, a good VCPR, and a good biocontainment plan um, can really save you a lot of time in developing a health plan. Um, it, 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 it just, you know, you go back to testing all these bulls on biosecurity. You know, what are we doing with these bulls? Even if they were bought at a prime purebred cattle sale, we want them BSE breeding soundness exam again. We want another trick test. We will do a physical exam on those bulls. We may even run some diagnostic tests that, like a BVD PI test or, or like a bovine leukosis test um, to see if we want to put these, these bulls into our, into our herd. So biosecurity is essential. Uh, biocontainment just keeps, it's just like right now, if you're sick, stay home. What, what the CDC is trying to do is biocontain COVID-19. Okay, next we're going to talk about building the animal. And, and this sometimes um, gets confusing to people. You can't just walk up to every, every calf and vaccinate them all and expect the same response from everyone, especially if that animal is unable to mount an immune response. So this is where we talk about nutrition, uh, parasite control, environmental control, how comfortable are your animals, how well fed are your animals, um, are they, are, can they, are the food that they're eating, is it going to them or is it going to parasites? Anything that decreases that immune system, um, can affect a, a health plan. So we take the little calf that was too weak to nurse. Is that calf, uh, from a question before, is that calf um, too weak to nurse because it has failure of passive transfer and has no immune system? Vaccinating that calf will do you no good. Um, they're not gonna be able to mount an immune response to, to the vaccines that you give. If you have a heavily parasitized animal that's already using all its resources to fight parasites, it cannot mount a response um, to the vaccines that you give 
or to the protocols that you use. And the same goes with nutrition. We've seen a lot of cattle come to us every year from the Southeast that are mineral deficient, micro minerals are deficient. They can't mount an immune response. We can hit them with every vaccine and every antibiotic that we have, uh, but these animals typically do not perform well. And they take a lot longer and a lot more money to try to, um, to, try to, to, to develop and get healthy. Uh, you need to sit down with your veterinarian and say, this is why I'm in the, the beef industry. This is the type of calf I'm trying to produce. How can I build the best animal? We have feedlots that like to come to our cow-calf producers um, and they, they want something that will respond and do well in the feedlot. So we, we start with genetics and after genetics, um, you know, which bulls are gonna be bred to which animals. And after genetics, we might go to nutrition. And after nutrition, we might go to parasite control um, and, and a healthy um, animal welfare-based environment where they're not under stress. Uh, so you have to control parasites and not just internal parasites where people say, um, you know, I, I want a dewormer or I want to worm my cattle, but also external parasites, um, also protozoa. We, you know, we go back to the sheep flock that had uh, a pretty good health plan, but um, ended up getting, getting a protozoa that, that really caused problems. So that was an environmental issue that we had to solve. Uh, to build a healthy animal to respond to your health plan. I have a client that does not vaccinate at all. He does not deworm at all. He does not, um, he does not actually even provide minerals or winter nutrition, but it's, he has chosen to select genetically for superior animals. It's extremely expensive to get started, but once you develop animals that can respond, um, you can actually do a pretty good job with that plan until you until your biosecurity breaks down. Uh, I can remember a case on this ranch where the neighbors will walk through their pasture for a few days, uh, and then we lost 22 head to pasturella uh, in less than a week. So that's a naive herd that does well until the biosecurity breaks down. So building that animal is is it's it's literally from conception to consumption. You're building an animal that will respond and be able to defeat disease, defeat parasites, defeat environmental stress, and come out and make a wonderful T-bone on the other side. We're all interested in vaccines. We're all interested in which vaccines do I use? How do I do it? We had a perfect example earlier of a man that asked a question concerning anthrax. It's a problem that, that like I said, I cannot answer and feel confident with it. Um, it's not one that we address. So your veterinarian in your county or in your area of Texas, Oklahoma, will be able to say, we face these problems. These are problems that you have to defend against. And vaccines um, are not all created equal. I encourage you all to go to the USDA website and look at labeling on cattle vaccines. Some vaccines, not all vaccines are created equal. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and some vaccines might be more expensive, but they do a better job. And on vaccines, you're worried about a few things. You're worried about duration of immunity. So when I give this shot, how long will it last? There are some leptos that last a year, and there are some lepto vaccines that don't last three months. That is one of our concerns with COVID right now is developing immunity that will last longer than a month. Um, so the same, the same thing with cattle vaccines is what is the duration of immunity? You want to know what is the duration to onset? What is the time to onset? If I give this vaccine under the skin today, when will it take effect? And most vaccines, nearly all vaccines, not all, but nearly all, require a booster. So if I give a shot today and I give a shot in a month, like the question on the black leg, um, then when will my cattle be protected? And how long will that protection last? There are internasal vaccines right now that have really rapid onset of immunity. I mean, it's for the sake of this conversation, it's basically the next day. Um, and they last about four months. Well, this works really well if you give these internasals at branding at three months of age, um, then these vaccines will last till weaning. So it, it depends on why do you have cattle? Are you raising heifers to keep? Well, maybe you wanna use a different vaccine than if you're gonna ship to the feedlot. Um, or to a stalker operation. 
No vaccine is 100%. And y'all need to, if you're going to write down a rule of thumb, no vaccine is 100%. Sometimes the animal does not mount an immune response. Sometimes every vaccine can be overwhelmed. So you can vaccinate for IBR today and after a month have an overwhelming assault of IBR on your calves and they may get sick. Um, so no vaccine is 100%. And most vaccine failure, uh, I would say 99% of vaccine failure has nothing to do with the vaccine. It has everything to do with the animal's ability to mount an immune response. It has to do with how you gave the vaccine, how you handled the vaccine, when you gave the vaccine in the production calendar. Um, it's a list of things, but most of those problems fall on your shoulders or on the shoulders of your veterinarians. So remember, vaccines are not um, the say-all and do-all. You need vaccines that are designed for the reason you're raising cattle, and you need vaccines that are um, designed for the diseases that you will face in your cattle at that time um, in your area of Texas. Meet with your veterinarian. Find out what you need. Then the last thing on this list is records. If you don't know what you gave, if you don't know when you gave it, if you don't know the serial number and the lot number, you have no ground to stand on, whether it's vaccine, uh, an antiparasitic drug, uh, antibiotic, uh, anti-inflammatory. You need to know what you give, when you give it, how you give it, what the product was, and why you gave it. This goes back to the VCPR, the, vi the veterinary client-patient relationship. Um, there has to be a reason for you doing this, and you have to keep records. How many times have I treated this calf? What was the response to treatment? Um, it goes back to morbidity and mortality. It goes back to response to first treatment or second treatment. This is information that is imperative that your veterinarian have to provide you with a health plan. Wow, Gabby, that was a little rushed, but uh, let's see, do we have any more questions? Just as a reminder, this will be our last section of questions. So. Go ahead and send those out there if you have anything else left. Um, the question over in chat is, um, could you please talk to us about the difference in dewormers being in being the ingestible liquid, pour on, and feed style? Is there a time to use multiple forms or, or and overlap the use of them? Okay, so this is a really complicated question and my answer is gonna piss your, and that's the wrong word. My answer is going to make your veterinarian probably angry. Um, so I do not believe in pour on dewormers. They're at best 70% uh, efficacious. Um, they have gotten us in some trouble with resistance because we use pour on dewormers a lot of times for convenience and a lot of times to control flies and not kill worms. And we also grossly underestimate the weight of our cattle. And when, you, when you're using a pour on, even if you're running them through the chute, Half the time you're deworming your chute or you're deworming your assistant or you're pouring it on the floor. So if I were you and you could do it, I'd get away from porons. There are worms, and your veterinarians will discuss this, like cuperia that affect young livestock. And cuperia dies really well in the face of white dewormers given orally. So there's an age factor that we have to worry about. There's also an age factor with cattle. A lot of cattle over the age of five might not need to be dewormed at all. Cattle under the age of two need a white dewormer in their program. I have a lot of ranches that combine an injectable dewormer and an oral dewormer at the same time. I have a lot of ranches that use an injectable dewormer on their adult cattle and an oral dewormer on their younger cattle. Um, I would always use a name brand dewormer from a name brand company and, and not uh, a generic form. The quality control in our generic products, in my opinion, is not as high as a quality of a name brand product. Again, this is where you sit down with your veterinarian and you determine what product you need. Uh, you can do fecal egg counts. They're, they can be tough to actually interpret whether they're, they're giving you inf information or not. Um, you can send fecal samples off to actually be cultured and determine what parasites you're fighting. But to answer your question, um, or uh, try to, think about dividing your cattle 
into age groups. So animals from three months to two years, animals from two years to five years, animals over five years, and developing um, parasite control programs, external and internal, for those different age groups. Uh, this allows you to design um, a really strategic, good seasonal deworming program for those young livestock, those first calf heifers, those second calf heifers that need heavy parasite control, where maybe you don't need that level of control in your old, older cows. Um, I could tell you all about Monte County, Clay County, Wise County, Young County, but I would have trouble going beyond this. If, if you go to West Texas, the parasite control plan out in the Big Bend is gonna be far different than the parasite control plan in Texarkana. Um, we are a big state and we have environmental differences all the way across the state. Um, we used to draw a line at the Mississippi River and parasite control on one side is different completely than parasite control on the other. Um, but now it's even, it's even more micro challenge than that. So, okay. Okay. And there hasn't been anything else come through. I'll give it another minute or so, but um, I know that this has been a challenging environment for you, Dr. Anderson, to, to do oh, this. This is because I'm old, Gabby. I mean, oh, you're fine. No, it's it's actually done. We've done really well with it. Um, I mean, we had a lot of good questions come through, and I'm just sad that the folks can't see you in person because he's, I, in my opinion, you're pretty funny, and um, <laughs> you, you'll get feed off of, of of people's backgrounds. And I know you're very dynamic and work well um, when you're on one on one kind of environment. So it's sad that it had to kind of happen this way, but we still appreciate you, you know, Thank taking. I'm with us and everything and, um, and not a problem and if people have questions uh, share my contact information with the clinic and and we'll be happy every year we answer questions for about three weeks following this presentation <laughs> will do yeah I was gonna say I haven't seen anything else come through but if people think of things um, in the interim um, oh wait here's one um, is it normal for the hemorrhoids to hang out sorry Okay, uh, cows don't have hemorrhoids. So you got a prolapse, probably have a prolapse rectum and it's not normal. Okay. That's, that's a very easy and fast answer. I'm glad you could roll that out fast. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I was saying, if anyone else thinks of anything, just let us know. We will um, try to get this recording out as soon as we can and we'll send out contact information um, after the class. Um, I usually, I mean, we, we sincerely want to thank Dr. Anderson for taking his time uh, with us today. And uh, he's a pretty busy guy uh, trying to train all the young, young kids out there to come out into your communities so that his outreach can, can stretch far beyond uh, North Texas and Oklahoma area. And we usually bribe him by giving him a free cap or something. But we're not in person. I'll have to find you one of our new styles. I'll just send it to you in the mail. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. And we had some folks coming in saying, thanks for doing this and you did a great job. And if you have any, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, ma'am. I'm good. I'll get the, the young assistant to figure out how to turn all this off now. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Well, we appreciate you so much and uh, we will talk to you soon. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.